this book is probably a third the size of the Waikato Wars, much easier for me to read. <laughs> but you've managed to squeeze in all, most of the battles. So let's just jump into the chapter about Te Whanganui Atara, Wellington, since we're here. Mm. Uh, what are some of the battle sites here in Te Whanganui Atara? Well, two, the two big ones in the region, um, Bukot's Farm, out on Lower Hutt, um, and further up, um, Battle Hill, um, Horakiri, near Pauatahanui. Um, but, you know, there are sites across Wellington that, that connect with the wars, and, and, and obviously um, streets named after people who took part in them as well or had a prominent role in the wars. So, you know, there's, there's kind of tangible reminders of this history everywhere if you look. In terms of the period of the wars, 1845 through to... 1881 to some and 1872 to others. Where was Wellington in that conflict? So the war, the, the conflicts here take place in 1846. Um, and this is really, it's a legacy of bungled New Zealand company transactions that take place in 1839. And um, as I said to you earlier... You so know, the New Zealand company is um, the you know, the private company that's come out from England and they're surveying up and selling off plots to, to New Zealanders. Yeah, they have this idea of systematic colonisation um, and, and they sell these lands in England to settlers who buy them in good faith, who arrive in New Zealand and discover that, um, you know, the company's transactions were, were largely bogus, really. Um, they weren't worth the paper they were written on. Uh, the Crown, after the signing of the Treaty in 1840, sets up a land claims commission to investigate these. William Spain finds major issues with the transaction, but a deal has been done in London that the company will get the lands regardless. Um, so there's a formula that's um, agreed between the company and the British government. For every one pound, I think, that's spent, you'll get four acres of land, regardless of what Māori think about it, regardless of the, of the transaction. So what they do in Wellington is they say we'll give additional compensation to Māori. Not that Māori have a choice whether to accept that or not. Just here's some more money, um, please leave those lands. And so this is how conflict happens in the Wellington region. Uh, Māori communities are cultivating lands in the Hutt Valley and they're told to leave. Eventually, reluctantly, they agree to that provided they receive additional compensation for their crops and so on. Um, Governor Gray basically refuses, declares martial law um, and, and war breaks out. It's interesting you say Gray because in that first five years after the signing of Te Tiriti or Waitangi in 1840, there were three different governors, William Hobson, Robert uh, Fitzroy and George Gray. What were the difference in the way that they led and how did that form the political landscape? Well, um, Hobson spent most of his governorship dying, basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, short-lived. Fitzroy was interesting because he was more sympathetic towards Māori viewpoints than most 19th century governors. For example, after um, the Wairau affray in the Northern South Island, 1843, again a legacy of, of New Zealand company actions, um, he found that um, the company had illegally surveyed lands uh, in the Marlborough district. And, and so he pointed the finger at them, which angered a lot of Pākehā, which is quite a brave, brave thing to do in the circumstances. Um, a key difference between him and, and um, Governor Gray, who replaces him in 1845, is Gray is resourced militarily and with finances, whereas Fitzroy, most, his administration is, is bankrupt for a lot of the time, uh, so he lacks finances to do things. But Gray arrives... Um, with large numbers of, of troops uh, and with resources. I guess in terms of the population balance at the time, what are we talking? Lots of people don't know. What, I mean, what was it in 1840? And then by the time Gov uh, Governor Gray had arrived, what was happening? So 1840, the Māori population um, is probably anywhere between 80,000 and 100,000. Uh, the Pākehā population was... 2,000, I think. So Pākehā were outnumbered 40 to 1, at least. Um, and that had changed a bit by the mid-1840s. Māori are still dominant um, by a long way. Not just demographically, but militarily, dominating the economy as well, um, growing crops, feeding the settlers in towns like Wellington. Um, a lot of them say they would have starved if it wasn't for Māori bringing them produce all the time. So Māori are, are kind of in charge, and, and these Pākehā who, who turned up 
here from the other side of the globe. They had this, these ingrained ideas that they were, they were the superior ones. They were supposed to be in charge. They come here and they find, whoa, what's happening? Actually, Māori are running the country. And a lot of them resent that. Um, but they're not strong enough, really, in the 1840s to do much about that because Māori are so powerful. You and I have both been working on stories of Waitara plug on RNZ, 28th of October. It'll come out. It's the second in the series of the uh, stories of Rua Pika Pika, but um, we, it puts a lens over the Taranaki story. Not all of the Taranaki stories, just the first part, because there's a, it's 21 years there. It came off the back of the Wairo, Afray, Wellington, and Whanganui. What was happening in Taranaki in 1860? Oh, <coughs> this is going to begin to sound like the New Zealand Company hour, but again, it's, it's a legacy of, of transactions in Taranaki where. Um, the, the settlers in Taranaki end up being confined to quite a narrow strip of land in and around New Plymouth. Um, and they covet additional lands. Waitara, especially to the north of New Plymouth, is, is an incredibly fertile area. And, and so that's one of the areas from, from the 1840, from the mid-1840s, um, their efforts to purchase those lands. And Te Atiawa continue to say, no, we will not sell Waitara. So they make that clear for about 15 years. 1859, um, Governor Gore Brown travels to New Plymouth, holds a hui with Māori, and um, I don't tell the office to sell Waitara. Others, including Wina McKingy, oppose that, make it clear that they have interest in those lands. But um, eventually, it, it, it's, it's assumed that um, their opposition is part of a land league. They're not really owners of those lands and so on, so their objections are ignored. The Crown goes ahead with this, and at that point, this becomes not so much a question of the fate of 600 acres of land in Taranaki. Again, it comes back to this question of who's in charge here? Who decides this dispute? Um, and so it is a question of really Rangatira Tanga versus sovereignty. Who's going to decide the outcome of this? And Brown insists that he must go through with this transaction. And I think Brown is probably under the mistaken belief that those opposing this don't actually have rights, but others like Don and McLean, I think they know better. McLean is told to go back to Taranaki and sort out the purchase. He doesn't go back because he knows they've created this enormous mess there. Uh, and so this leads to, uh, in, in 1860, um, the government orders a survey of the lands under armed guard, Te Atiawa, um, send out Kiwi, an elderly woman, to pull out the surveyor's pegs. The reason they do that is to make it clear that they're going to object to this peacefully. Because that was one of the rules of, of buying land, wasn't it? That you had to, either the Queen had to buy it or you couldn't buy disputed land. So many of the people who were in 1860 had come back, were travelling back from Wellington. They were Taranaki Te Atiawa. That's right. And... and their leader, uh, Woodham Kingi, in the 1840s, had a reputation as a loyalist. Um, he, I don't think he fought for the crown um, against the Rokbaha and Te Rangi Hayata, but he didn't fight against it either, and he was seen as a, a, a friend of the crown. But he wouldn't sell Waitara, and um, in 1860, he's still desperately attempting to avoid war, uh, pleading with the government to talk to him. But instead, so the, the Kuya pull out the survey pegs, the government's response to that is to describe that as an act of rebellion and to declare martial law in Taranaki. And so weeks later, that conflict breaks out at Te Kohia. And Te Kohia are the first shots of the Taranaki war. Why is that, um, why is that important? Who, who fired? Uh, well, um, I think, you know, there was this... Before that, it was said that for... For Te Atiawa, the really important thing was that they didn't fire the first shots because then their cause would be seen as a just one, that they were defending themselves. And so they bought that par, and it's um, what, what, what James Balch describes as one of the modern Māori pa. And it's something that can be um, evacuated quite easily. Uh, so 17th of March, 1860, um, this conflict at Te Kohia, I think the British troops croup up creep up to it the next morning and discover that everybody has left. And this is, for the next year, you have war in Taranaki. The British forces are continually, are continually attempting to um, 
draw Māori out into the open because the British have superior numbers in artillery and so on. So if they fight out in the open, then they can, they can use those advantages to be their best will. But for, for Māori, and this is consistent through a lot of these wars, their tactics have to be more flexible because all of the odds are stacked against them. And so the next year, um, the Crown is continually frustrated in its efforts to have this decisive conflict. Although what happens is some months after the war begins, contingents from Waikato, Ngati Mani Apoto, and other iwi turn up and start fighting alongside Te Atiawa. And that's important as well because Waikato Tainui are one of the, the biggest, most powerful iwi in the country at this time. Um, and the Crown suffers, you know, some pretty significant reverses as a result of that. And that, that has implications further down the track when Waikato Tainui are then alleged to have committed an act of rebellion themselves. And um, you talk about uh, in Waitara how uh, the Crown had to s started to survey um, the sections up and the Kuya would pull out the survey pegs in an act of, well, to let them know that this land wasn't for sale. That's an interesting part of the story, though, because um, that is the one piece of land that they say was up for sale, regardless of this land league, as you said, that had decided no more land would be for sale. So there was one piece of land, and that is the disputed piece of land, isn't it? Yeah, so, I mean, this is... Um, the, the wider history there is that um, in 1854, there's a large hui um, held at a place called Marawapo, and, and many iwi in Taranaki um, agree to place their lands under tapu. And for settlers, many of them describe this as a land league, an illegal combination, an affront to the Crown sovereignty. And so these, these bigger issues kind of come into play as a result of that. What do you make of some of the fighting chiefs like Te Rangitake and Hapurona, Kawiti, as you've been researching? What kind of uh, men are these? Oh, um, well, you know, a number of them were remarkable military geniuses. Um, uh, Kawiti in the Northern War, um, you know, he was really the father of this new pass system. And the British... Um, Often when they looked at these power and they refused to believe that Māori could have built them without Pākehā assistance. There must have been some engineering expert from England who, who had come out here and, and, and advised them on it because Māori surely could not build something so sophisticated, so brilliant as, as he did. Um, and related to that is the, the fact that the British officers again and again refused to learn the lessons from this. That there's this kind of thing that they... You know, a highway is, is the first of it. They think that if they bombard a path for a week or a few days or a few hours and then they hear nothing from inside, then everybody is dead. So they can safely go and attack it. They do that at a highway. Within 10 minutes, um, 110 people, are, British soldiers, are killed or wounded as a result. 20 years later, they're still doing it at Gate Power and elsewhere. It's like, did you not learn anything from, from the earlier history of conflict between Māori and Pākehā in New Zealand. So is it true this is where trench warfare came from? Oh, well, that's a, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I'm not sure where James Bellock stands on that original um, stance that he took now, whether, he, whether he's, he, maybe he's, um, he's probably willing to suggest that he might have gone a bit far on that. But I think the point that he was making was that, you know, this, these new pass systems were brilliant. They didn't come from anywhere else. They were designed right here in New Zealand. Māori designed them. But the British soldiers uh, caught on quickly because in Taranaki at Pukirangi Order, which was the end of the first war, um, there was an amazing sapping. Um, tell us about that. It went for three and a half kilometres? Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, this, the, as I say, the, the, the engineering genius behind these paths was, was staggering. And the end of that first Taranaki war is this process of the British laboriously sapping towards the pa. Um, and that one was hugely significant as well. Um, and then um, Wudamu Tamihana, the great Ngāti Hoa Rangatira, arrives in Taranaki and he almost single-handedly um, negotiates a ceasefire to that conflict. And so the first Taranaki war 
ends inconclusively, really. There's, there's no clear victor in that. And that wasn't what the, the British expected in March 1860. They thought that it would be a quick, short, sharp conflict in which the Crown forces would, their, their obvious superiority would, would shine out. But that doesn't happen. And there was an inquiry into the sale of the land. What was the outcome? Uh, so the, the purchase of the Waitara lands is found, found to be unjust and those lands are returned to Te Atu Awa. Not long after, they're confiscated by the Crown uh, as a result of the second um, Taranaki War after 1863. And then there's, there's this long sequence of conflict in Taranaki, almost endless warfare, wave after wave of invasion. Um, and so that's, you know, Parihaka, um, nearly 20 years later, still dealing with the consequences or legacy of that Raupatu and those confiscations. Uh, following the Taranaki Wars was the Waikato Wars, which, which was the subject of your very long uh, book that you released in 2006 <laughs> that I still haven't finished. Um, from the release of that book through to today, what have you learned? What have been the responses? Oh, um, well, the response to the book was phenomenal. Um, and it really began the day we launched it because um, we launched it at the Wahipa Pokai um, 8th of October 2016. The Pokai, a very important part of the Kingitanga calendar. And um, I was doing some work for Waikato Tainui and I, I, they asked me to give a presentation about the book and so I did that. And they said, oh, well, you'll launch it at the Pokai on the 8th of October. I thought, okay, well, I'd better finish it before then, hadn't I? But, so it was, it was a great honour to be invited to to launch the book in that way. And so, Imagine if you didn't rush to the end. Imagine how much longer it could have been. <laughs> well, you know, you might th think the book is long, but the, the original uh, draft that I sent in was probably way longer, I think. And publishers had palpitations when they saw it. But, so, yeah, we launched, we launched it at the, the Pope Kai, handed over the first official uh, copy to King Tehetia, and then uh, sort of wandered off um, around the back um, to where they were sort of setting up uh, to sell books. And I thought, what's the commotion happening here? There's a huge crowd there. And by the time it took me just to walk around the back of the Marae, dozens of people had raced up there to form a queue to start buying the books. And for the next sort of four or five hours, I was signing copies for the Kuia, the Karoa, um, on that Marae. And that was awesome. I, I mean, it was just such an, a special day. Did you not expect that? No. In terms of, <laughs> you know, like... I mean, there's not a lot of places that you can find the history of Aotearoa through the, you know, through um, a bicultural kind of framework. Yeah, well, and I mean, the remarkable thing about that book was that it was the first big overview of the Waikato War since 1879. Like, since then, people have written books about the Great South Road, the role of steamers in the war, but the usual thing was the Waikato War was just a couple of chapters in the New Zealand Wars as a whole. And I thought that story was, was too important just, you know, to be relegated to just a few chapters in a book about the New Zealand Wars as a whole. Um, and, you know, that work started really um, about 10 years earlier. I was researching for the Waitangi Tribunal on, for the Rohe Potai King Country Inquiry. And they asked me to do a couple of reports on the Waikato War, what came before, confiscations and so on. And, even the people who commissioned me, I think, assumed that this was, would all be very straightforward because hadn't that story already been told before? James Belch told it before him, James Cowan, and so on. And then as I got into it, the, the more and more things I discovered that just staggered me, and I thought, well, people need to know this history. We need to engage with it. What were some of the greatest moments of discovery for you in there? Um, I think... I think the moment I realised that I needed to, to publish this in some form was when I, I, I worked out that the, the death rate, Māori death rate, was higher on a per capita basis than that suffered by New Zealand troops during World War I, which is supposed to be the greatest bloodbath in New Zealand history. And I was like, wow, that's incredible. Um, and another thing I found, um, you don't have a lot of sort of moments when you're sitting down at the archives when you have a eureka moment, you've found a document, but I did that once with that. I found a document around... So this is ultimatum that's issued on the 11th of July, 1863, to Waikato Māori, saying um, you should 
comply with the directions of the Crown or all of your lands to be confiscated and, and by the way we're about to invade Waikato and so on. And the invasion begins the next day and there'd been anecdotal evidence that that ultimate, ultimatum wasn't delivered until after the invasion began. But I actually found a draft of it in archives and it, it's, on the top of it it's got scribbled this revised to His Excellency Sir George Grey and it's got the date the 13th of July. So that they were still drafting that ultimatum the day after the invasion began. In other words, they didn't even want to give Māori a chance to comply with this. It was, they're just trying to frame this as just war by saying, look, you had every opportunity to comply with this. They didn't. They didn't at all. And actually finding that piece of paper, they said they were still writing it after the war had begun. was just incredible. I can see, well, I can't see Leah Bell, but I know she's here. Um, she was part of the movement calling for the National Day of Commemoration. Ho mai te paki paki mo, Leah. Um, and uh, we, now, we now have a commitment by this government to teach histories in schools. Is this a turning point, do you think? I think so. I hope so. I, I, I mean, I think just in the last two or three years, we've started to turn a corner, I think. And the work of Leah and the other students at Otahonga College, I think, has been a really important part of that because um, people are starting to, to understand that we need to engage with this history, we need to take ownership of it as a nation. And that's, you know, it's through dialogue, through being honest, through self-reflection that we begin to heal as a nation. We can't do that if we try... You know, Pākehā have tried to sort of blocked that all away for a long time. And before, before that, before the 1970s, there was this kind of elaborate myth-making around these wars as well. Rewe's last stand, this sort of chivalrous and noble conflict, when the reality was there was nothing chivalrous or noble about it. It was just bloody and brutal. And so, you know, taking ownership of that history, I think, is incredibly important. And the thing is that, you know, long, young people like Leah and others have been calling for this for years. So it's, it's just the adults catching up now. We're finally kind of listening to that. About time. It's interesting you talk about Rewi's last stand because in the Waikato war books and probably in here, I can't quite remember if I've read it in there, the, there's times where New Zealand has tried to remember or commemorate and tell us about some of the things you found from the early 1900s. Well, when I first started researching that, I assumed that Pākehā had always forgotten this history, always ignored it. And then I looked back at what had happened at Arako, the final conflict of the Waikato War, 1914, it's the 50th anniversary, um, and there's a huge crowd gathered on the site there to unveil the monument that stands there now. The really interesting thing is that just about all of them were Pākehā. And I think the reason for that is they called it a celebration. And what they were celebrating was, uh, it's, it's said on the program, 50 years of peace. And the subtext also was the greatest, and the greatest race relations in the world. So Araka was kind of like the birth of this, this mythical um, event where Māori and pa Pākehā had forged this mutual respect in battle and settled down to live happily ever after. And no wonder hardly any Māori were there because they're not going to celebrate Araka where their ancestors are killed their lands are confiscation, uh, confiscated, you know, generations condemned to lives of poverty. And so there's this real disjunction between how Māori and Pākehā kind of remember that history and engage with it. So much of those battles and conflicts are interwoven. Um, I'm thinking about at Parihaka in 1881, you know, which some would say was the last of the wars, but uh, Taranaki will say their war is never ending in terms of the way that their people have to live now. But in terms of Parihaka, um, they say that Sir Maui Pōmari was there as a child, um, got his toe taken off when a horse stood on it or something like that, and he had come from Waitara when they had lost their land, so these, you know, the, the stories just continue to go. Did you find that? Absolutely. Um, I remember... Um Kaumatua from, from Gisborne, from Te Atanga Mahaki, who, um, he gave evidence to the Waitangi Tribunal in the Tūranga hearings, and he talked about, as a child, he was raised by his great-grandmother. And his great-grandmother, as a child, was one of the children who were sent to Whadikauri, to the Chatham Islands with Tukoti. Mm. That Kaumatua died earlier this year, so that was a living connection with this history. That, that's how recent this history is. It's, it's just incredible to hear him talking about that. And, 
you know, one of the things he talked about was um, at the end of World War II, I think, he enlisted in the Māori Battalion. He couldn't go and see his great-grandmother because he was in uniform and that, you know, that would have um, been a traumatic experience for her after everything she'd been through to see him in uniform. Does that surprise you so many Māori joined the war, you know, joined the forces to fight the war for Queen and Country? Well, I think, there are, I think there are complex reasons behind that. And in World War I, there was significant opposition, especially uh, Waikato Tainui and Taranaki, um, partly because you know, King Tafia, after the Waikato War, had um, basically um, you know, said that we are pacifists now, that they wouldn't fight further wars. But also, uh, as Te Puya Hirangi said, um, I think there's a quote where she said, we're asked to fight for king and country. Um, we've, got a, we've got a king, but we don't have our country anymore. Give it back and then we'll think about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, large numbers of Tainui men are, are, are imprisoned as a result of, of failing to, um, to go and fight this war. World War II is slightly different. Um, and there, I think, there's this... With the, the, the first Labour government coming in 1935, there's a willingness to recognise some of the injustices in these conflicts, in a, albeit in a very limited way. So there's this kind of expectation that if Māori uh, serve in those wars, um, there will be some reciprocity as a result of that. And so you get 1944, 46, you get settlements in, in Taranaki and Waikato, which extremely flawed by today's standards, but there was this, you know, a different kind of understanding. I mean, Nata talked about the price of citizenship was, was fighting for the Crown in these wars, and there was an expectation that um, there would be a response from the Crown to that. There is, but in quite a limited way, really. And, um, you know, as you were saying, they were, set, they were told if they were to fight, they would, to, you know, probably receive land parcels, I think that was, and, you know, some of the treaty settlements up the East Coast now reflect that they didn't, and uh, I think one farm up the East Coast has been purchased back, which was a promised farm. So yeah. this year, Te Pūtake o Te Riri um, Te Atiawa hosting, um, and it's centred around the Waitara land purchase, as we know. How did you feel about narrating, you know, this episode of our, his of our history? Oh, well, it's a um, tremendous privilege to be on screen alongside you. Um, and um, I think, you know, documentaries like that, uh, we need more of them. We need innovative and creative ways to tell this history. Not just books, but on screen, um, apps, websites, podcasts. There are, there are loads of ways that we can engage with this history um, because, as I say, it's kind of everywhere, but a lot of people are oblivious to, to these sites. Uh, you know, people in, in, in places like Waikato and Taranaki would probably drive by or, or often through par sites every day, and they wouldn't even know that they were there. I took you to a place called Redoubt 3. Remember that? Up the, it was on private land, and it belonged to the Ona Fano, who the family had farmed it since... Um, probably 1901 or something. Um, so we had to knock on the door to get there. Tell us what we saw when we got there. Yeah, so there's, there's a small cross there which is in a gated off um, little reserve, which I think is technically, um, I can't remember whether it's Crown or Council land, but it's not part of the farm, but the only problem is you can only get to it if you ask the farmer for permission. There's no right of way to that reserve. And that's a site where I think at least 35 Māori were killed. Um, and there's, you know, it's quite staggering that there isn't um, guaranteed access. I mean, the farmer was, he was great, but a lot of people would be reluctant to go and knock on somebody's door and say, please, can we go and, and honour our ancestors who died here or, or we want to find out about the site. And so I think, you know... Now that we've got, or we're going to get, um, this history taught in all schools, the, the, really, the next big thing is look after the sites, protect them properly, because the sites connect us with this history, and once we lose them, we, we lose part of our, our story. And so places like there, you know, I think we can, we can do a lot better, and 
a lot of these parasites, as I say, you know, the way you find them, they've got a road through the middle of them. Yeah, tell us about some of the work you've been doing with your lovely partner, Joanna, um, over the last little while going around. What are some of the, you know, the wonderful places that you've found and... Oh, um, yeah, so our, our Marsden project is looking at the ways that the wars have been remembered and forgotten over time. Um, so less about what happened than, than about the memories of them and, and also the silences around that history. Um, and part of that involves visiting a number of these sites. Um, earlier in the year, we did this big trip around the Escape um, to Apotiki and elsewhere. Um, and that was, a lot of it um, was kind of following in the footsteps of Kiriopa Tiro and the story of the East Coast Wars. Um, some of the sites we visited, um, Obananui um, in Hawke's Bay, again on private land on a, um, an apple orchard, I think. Incredibly hard to find. You turn up Obananui Road, there's a sign for the mini golf course, the B&B, the rubbish tip, everything but this historic site. It's like, you know, we, we, we just want, we want, it. it's almost like Pakeha want to hide these sites, like they're not even there. Um, so, you know, that was one. And we went to another, you know, a number of other uh, places. Um, the church uh, in Apotiki where Volkner was killed, that, that eventually led to hunting down Kiriopa um, and his eventual execution um, at the old Napier jail, which we visited at the end of our trip. And so that was, you know, and going there was quite a, you know, very emotional kind of thing once you, you knew all that history and you, and you followed in all of those different sites. Others like Waringa Hika at Gisborne along the way, but, um, you know, it's just incredibly powerful to, to stand in some of those places once you know the history. The, 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 you know, being on those sites, it, it connects us with those stories. So that's why, you know, we need to do way better looking after them. How do iwi, um, you know, treat their stories differently? Like, what's when you worked with the Ngāpuhi and Ngāti Hini people at Rua Pika Pika, and then you came to Taranaki, now you've gone over to the East Coast, and what, what kind of differences do you see? Well, I, I think for one um, is, is that for Māori, these stories have always been there, so that, that there is this kind of awareness of this history. Um, whereas for Pākehā, as I say, I think from about the 1970s, um, it became clear that Pākehā couldn't really get away with this myth-making about the wars being these wonderful adventures anymore. And Pākehā no longer kind of knew how to talk about this history. It was too difficult because it made people feel guilty and ashamed and so on. And so these became kind of like the dirty secrets that we just lock away in a cupboard somewhere and pretend they don't exist. Um, and so I think the last few years is kind of moving beyond that to a stage where can we talk about this history again now and, and can we do it in a in a mature way that says that this is an important part of our story and we need to take ownership of this history. The wars from 1845 through to 1872, obviously the legacies of the wars are all different, but what do you think the legacy of the New Zealand wars are, is? Uh. Um, well, I, I think, as I, I suggested in The Great War for New Zealand, that um, these were defining conflicts in New Zealand history, way more so than, than Gallipoli or the Western Front, in terms of the way they transformed the country. For one thing, as I say, there's, there's, you've got these two kind of different understandings of what was this treaty deal that was entered into in 1840, what did that mean? On the one hand, there's crown expectations of unbridled sovereignty. Pākehā expect to be in charge, and they think that they're superior. Um, they arrive here, they discover the situation is quite different. On the other hand, Māori have been promised rangatiratanga. And also, so they have an expectation that they'll continue to manage their own affairs, they always have. Um, the governor will look after Pākehā matters, and matters that affect both peoples um, the governor and, and Rangatira will come together and they will mutually agree, you know, procedures with that. So this is like, on the one hand, you've got this idea of Crown Promise and the other partnership. And actually, the signing of the treaty itself 
It doesn't change a lot on the ground. In most areas, Māori continue to manage their own affairs as they always had. If you're in the middle of Waikato in the mid-1840s, you weren't in an area where the writ of, of, of British law ran. You were in an area controlled by Waikato Tainui. So Pākehā settled there. They, you know, they, they were obliged to observe, um, to some extent, other tikanga. And you know, for a lot of them resented that. So these two different ideas about the nature of that relationship, they coexist for at least 20 years. And that's why the wars in the 1860s are really, if you want a kind of overriding theme, it's which, which of these visions of the treaty relationship is going to prevail? Is it about crown, crown primacy or is it about partnership? And, you know, the crown in, in wars like Waikato, they don't achieve total victory because one of the things they attempted to do there is destroy the Māori king movement, and they failed in that. The king of Tonga is still around today. But they were successful enough to impose their vision, and that, you know, as I said earlier, that had almost immediate consequences because the Waikato War ends 1864. Within 12 months of that, you've got the Nau Flame Court established, which would have been inconceivable 10 years earlier. Two years after that, you've got the native school system set up again. Like, th these are a signals of a, a much harsher crown approach towards Māori. It's like, no longer do we have to um, feel the need to consult with Rangatira about this stuff. We're just going to impose this. So this is kind of uni the crown acting unilaterally in a much harsher way that wouldn't have been possible years earlier for all sorts of reasons. So that's, that's a really big one. Um, it's obviously, I mean, another, another legacy is the economic one. Um, and that through the 1840s and 1850s, Māori are basically dominating the New Zealand economy, generating a lot of the export income, generating a lot of the Crown's um, tax revenue, despite the fact that they're not represented in the parliament that's set up in, 18, uh, set up in 1854. Um, so, you know, iwi and, and Waikato and elsewhere, they're exporting produce. They're not just sending it to Auckland and Wellington, they're sending it to, to Sydney. Um, San Francisco. When um, in, in, at the end of the documentary that's going to come out for the Waitara story, we ask one of the co-mātua there, what does he think the legacy of the Waitara War is, and in terms of the street names that are everywhere, you know, there's Craycroft and Brown and all the lieutenant colonels and the rest of them that fired upon them. I said, is that tough to work, to live with? And he said, no, it's not so much those street names, because we know who the bad guys were once, but it's the rangatira whanau who are still living hard, you know, the, the descendants of these chiefs who lost their land and still are living in poverty. I wonder, and you know, if you take Waitara as like an example, how do you bring the rest of the town on board? Um, well, if Waitara is, is, is difficult because of the, uh, the legacy of those leasehold lands there as well. But I think part of it is engaging with the history and have genuine, having genuine dialogue. And we saw some of that with the um, Parihaka reconciliation ceremony where incredible things happened there. I think there were descendants of John Bryce who led the invasion of that settlement in 1881. They were there as part of that. Mm -hmm. And those, imagine being there, the, you know, the descendants of Bryce who did these terrible things to those people and bringing him together with the descendants of those attacked then. That, you know, those sorts of conversations are where you achieve things. That's the way to get healing, is to have that dialogue, to have that conversation, to be honest about this history. Is there something in this book that you want to share with somebody, something that you found or, you, you know, some great research? In there, what part? Anything new that we don't know? Well, there, uh, there were some new things that I learned writing it, and one of them, again, was um, some of the Taranaki conflicts. And everybody knows about the first Taranaki War, Tutukiwaru, Parihaka, and so on. But there were these other conflicts that I knew less about. Um, a couple of campaigns in 1866. One was led by um, General Shute who replaced Duncan Cameron as the commander of British forces in New Zealand. And Cameron had left New Zealand basically disgusted by the war. And he, he, he became very disillusioned with it. He saw it as a war. Uh, 
you know, a war of dispossession for the benefit of settlers in New Zealand. Why should, why should my men be dying in this war? Why don't they fight themselves? And that was an attitude a lot of the soldiers, I think, increasingly had. But Shute comes here, he's an Irishman. He's got a much tougher approach. He came from um, serving in India after the Indian um, mutiny. Um, I think it's called the First Indian War of Independence now. But one of the things he was responsible for was... Um, strapping Indian prisoners to the end of cannons and blowing them to bits. Then he comes to New Zealand and fights Māori. Do, do you think his outlook on, on other peoples who are non-British has changed fundamentally? Not really. And he conducts this extraordinary, ruthless and brutal campaign in Taranaki early in 1866 to the extent that one of his senior officers, uh, Colonel Weir of the 50th Regiment, um, writes home to his brother and he says that they've been ordered to take no prisoners, and he, he makes all sorts of other allegations. His brother is so concerned about this that he, he sends a letter to the colonial office and says, look what's happening in New Zealand. These terrible atrocities are happening. And this eventually comes back to New Zealand. Um, and I, I don't think Colonel Weir had realised that his letter was going to be published and there was going to be this massive controversy, but there's this whole debate around whether atrocities have been committed in Taranaki. And at the end of that... Colonel Weir is basically forced to retract his letter, but he still stands by the fact that he was ordered not to take any prisoners, which is extraordinary. So that's early in 1866. Later on in 1866, uh, I think it's Thomas McDonnell leads another campaign. Um, one of the settlements they attack is a place called Pōkaikai. They attack it in the middle of the night. The rangatira of that settlement um, has gone to New Plymouth to negotiate peace with the Crown. Um, McDonnell is miffed, miffed by this that, that um, he, you know, he's not negotiating with him personally. So they attack him in the middle of the night. It's like Rangiafia, it's, it's not a fighting pass, it's just an open, open kainga. And, and there are basically women and children there. And so it's, it's not one of these, these major incidents of the wars that everybody knows about. But again, it was extraordinarily brutal and bloody. Mm. What do you want people to take away from this new book? Um, I think that. Um, I think the thing I've been talking about the last couple of years is just that as a nation we need to take ownership of this history and we can't just cherry pick out the bits we'd prefer to remember from the past. We need to be honest with ourselves about our history and that is a basis for genuine reconciliation and healing. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you very much. <laughs>